Thank you for the, uh, the invitation to moderate this panel today. Just before we kick it off, I just wanted to give you a little bit of my own background with, with G-Log, as Chirac said. Uh, I've been in the industry over 30 years. I started implementing TMSs in the 90s. Uh, and around the time that G-Log was founded, I actually uh, uh, was part of a dot-com company, which late 90s, early 2000s, all these dot-com companies came around. Uh, we're a company called Transportation Zone. We're going to be a global freight management solution. And we were looking at a TMS, but at the time, there was mainly two big TMSs out there, which was the I2 solution, and then you had Manugistics. And we started our journey with Manugistics until early 2000. We heard these rumors about this new generation TMS coming along, a company called G-Log. So I found myself in December of 2000 flying from the UK, where I was living at the time, to Philadelphia to actually visit uh, the folks at G-Log uh, in the Valley Forge area. Um, and then fast forward, obviously 2005, G-Log got acquired by Oracle. Uh, I was at the time at PepsiCo, but then in 2014, I joined Gartner. I took over the research for all the uh, transportation technology area. Uh, and it's when I started working with Derek and Srini and the whole team at Oracle. And so really seeing the evolution of the Oracle uh, product going from G-Log to OTM to what it is over the last 24 years. So I couldn't be happier to moderate today's panel. I'll ask the, the panelists to come up uh, and talk, give you a little bit of kind of behind the scenes look of how is G-Log really created? What were some of the core foundational elements that were really top of mind when creating G-Log? And how those things like, you know, customer focus and collaboration and innovation how they're still working today where the product is OTM and where we're going to see that going into the future. So with that, please all have a seat. What I wanted to do is have everyone just do a quick introduction of yourself, maybe going back to what your role was originally at G-Log and what your current role is. And if you have a fun anecdote from your G-Log days, please share that as well. OK, is this on? Everyone good with the sound? All righty. So hello, I am Mary Beth Roberts. Uh, my role from G-Log days was uh, VP of Software Development. And my current role, uh, Oracle, is with the sort of distinguished software engineer. I like that distinguished role, huh? Uh, so I oversee a lot of the development with OTM, GTM, and SCM. I do have a little bit of a funny story to, to share, or a, a memory that came back. Um, so here we are. And I'm going to paint you a picture of what week one looked like 25 years ago. It was not so glamorous as what we're sitting here seeing today. So at that time, we had JP and Mitch up in Connecticut. And we had Jim, myself, and Carl, week one, we're going to put together our development group here for, in Valley Forge. So we needed to get office space. So our friend who is a real estate broker said, hey, I'm going to look for you guys for office space. We're going to get started. But in the meantime, I have this one area vacated. You guys can use that while we're getting ready. So that first week uh, comprised of Jim, Carl, and I showing up at that space because we got it as is with buckets, mops, and brooms to clean it all up to get ready to open up for G-Log. So we were very hands-on even then. So that was story. the beginning of G-Log. We were the awesome. most expensive cleaning team <laughs> Bingo! Ever. Bingo! Ever. And when you think about it, the VCs we're looking at, we're paying you guys to do what? But there we were. Yeah. Jim, were you part of that cleaning team? Yes, I was. Yes, I was. Uh, Jim Mooney, I was uh, Chief Technology Officer of G-Log, which was you know, development, hosting, support. Um, I don't have that title at Oracle. This guy named Larry has it, so I <laughs> couldn't take that. Um, and, and my uh, funny story is we had an early customer in the Philadelphia area that was a, um, a freight forwarder that uh, worked with us building out our freight forwarding functionality. You know, they, we're, they were, in, we were in each other's offices every week. Um, and we started talking, yes, you do. You work closely with someone about other things you do. And we started talking smack about football. Well, I started talking smack <laughs> about football, let's be honest, about playing a football game against them. So we set up a football game, the G-Log people against this customer of ours. 
And uh, we ended up beating them in a football game, which, of course, there was no salespeople involved. They never would have let us beat them. Um, and that, uh, that team, the other team, they really heard it from their CEO down, like, you let a bunch of computer nerds beat you in a football game? Uh, needless to say, they're no longer a customer. <laughs> Um, I'm Carl Baker. I'm Vice President of Product Management. And at G, or G Log, I, I was Vice President of Product Management. So I'm. You've done a lot with your life. Yeah. Uh, there's some Peter principle going on there. I, I'm not really sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where I'm going to go from here, Jim, but you know, I'm still there. Um, and I, I have sort of a, an anecdote from. Uh, as we get into this, we'll talk about the customer centricity of, of how we develop this product. And we just have these things called JAD sessions, and we bring our clients down. And at one of these JAD sessions, uh, one of the clients, their names was Logistics Gateway. They're no longer in business, so I, I can talk about them. Um, it's, it's vaguely religious, this Logistics Gateway name. But anyway, they were from Canada, and they sent four people down. I was like, wow, that's a big investment for a small company to send four people down. And yeah, they're going, yeah, yeah, we, we, we fueled up the Windstar and we flew down last night. And I'm like, wow, you guys have a private jet and you came down? So we went and we did the JAD session and, you know, we're, we're leaving. And they all get into this minivan and it's a Ford Windstar. So the whole time I'm like, you totally got me. And they, they got no features, so I tell you. You, you. you fool me like that. You don't do anything. So I'm JP Wiggins. At the start of G-Log, I built the implementation team, the pre-sales, and consultants for the install. Um, I didn't go to Oracle after the sale. I ended up at SAP for about 10 years on their TM and EWM side. Boo. Um, and then uh, after that, I uh, started a company called 3G TMS, uh, co-founded that, and uh, since left on, and now I'm doing a company called One Log Tech, which are one of the sponsors down on the floor. Come talk to us. So my funny uh, anecdote would be when we started the company, you know, you had to, the domain name was a challenge. So glog.com, do you remember this? Mm -hmm. glog.com was actually held by a, a hacker, let's call it, that built bombs and how to make homemade pipe bombs and displays and, you know, total anarchy site. And so when, so we had glogtech.com and then it was Mitch West here. So he was like, JP, you got to get this. So I'm like trying to send this guy $2 bills in the mail. I kid you not for buying the site and it had to be unmarked bills. And, and then eventually, uh, you know, it's like all our friends were like saying, you guys are into some real heavy software. <laughs> so, but obviously we ended up getting the domain name eventually because he, he forgot to renew his uh, permit. So um, learn something new every day. Um, <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Derek Giddos. Um, I am not one of the founders of G-Log. I wasn't there at the, uh, at the, at the origin. I joined in uh, 2000. I was uh, hired by Carl Baker, worked in the product management team. Uh, I am, however, I guess I'll take credit or responsibility for being a co-founder of Oracle Transportation Management because I left Oracle, or excuse me, I left G-Log, joined Oracle, and two years later helped lead the acquisition. Uh, of the company because I miss them all so dearly, so we had to, I had to figure out a way to uh, get, get, get back together. Um, and at present, I run the product strategy team at Oracle that's responsible for all of our logistics and order management products. Uh, I have several funny anecdotes. None of them are suitable for sharing in this audience. <laughs> so you can talk to me later. Hey, uh, Paul Hamill. So I joined as employee number seven at the KOP office as a software developer for Jim, Carl, Mary Beth, and I was smart and waited until they cleaned the office, so <laughs> that was very nice of them, but they didn't leave me a lot of room, so I was also the receptionist because I was the only desk available. <laughs> so I had to uh, make coffee and answer the phone, and not much changed because my role today is still, I make the coffee at home, so. <laughs> and, and Jim is still cleaning up messes. <laughs> awesome. I guess you guys all miss those days, huh? <laughs> 25 years. Anyway, so when you guys started, because I think some of you came from other companies that were also doing TMS, um, and obviously you had a, a vision. What was really the vision that started G-Log, and then obviously with the G3 product, the Global Command and Control Center, did I say that correctly? Yep. Um, so what was really the vision behind the company when you originally started the company? I don't know, Mary Beth or Jim, if you want to start with that. 
Um, I think one of the, the visions was we've been in the TMS space for so long and had seen each, each pillar situation where you'd had like an LTL product, a truckload product, international, and they were very disparate systems. All similar in some ways, but, but multiple different, different systems. So the vision for, for G-Log, and you look at some of the PowerPoints and stuff that uh, Jim will be showing, was to build a platform that could support global logistics uh, in an integrated fashion, and that the goal was somebody would be able to run a global company here on all modes in our GC3. Yeah, and I would just add to that that um, we, at, at our previous, prior to G-Log, the previous place we were, the, the customers we were speaking to were asking for something that we could not take that product to. We, had, we knew we had to develop a whole new thing. We knew we had to build a whole new platform. We tried to do it at the previous company and, knew, and just wasn't the right time at that company to do that. So that's why we, uh, we, had, the, we had an opportunity. We decided to start uh, G-Log because we knew we had to start with a whole new platform. Awesome. Now, we're talking about the vision. You guys, early days, you started the company. Uh, I would say challenging times, right? Late 90s, yet the year 2000 coming up, right? People thought the world was going to literally go down or everyone spent billions of dollars together in kind of getting ready for the year 2000, very closely after that. We had 9-11, we had the dot-com era, I was part of that, you know, it was all great until it wasn't, right? So JP, what were some of the challenges you guys were actually seeing and some of the things you had to overcome? Surviving Mitch Wesley. <laughs> No, I got to say that Mitch was our CEO at the time. Mitch is one of my great personal friends. He's one of the most brilliant people I know on earth. But with that brilliance, it comes some eccentricness, and that's what makes it funny for us here, for those that know Mitch. But like I said, I love Mitch. He's since retired. I still talk, just talked to him last week. But I, I think the first really was you know, the dot-com era. Um, we were able to make this. It was a point in time where we were able to raise a significant amount of money uh, to build such a large R&D effort, to build such a product that we, what was in our vision. But the thing was is the investors wanted us to be this dot-com, which we knew was wrong. It was the opposite of what we wanted, if you understand what dot-coms were. And I think this actually led to a lot of the, the core vision of the company that's made it so successful, which is the JAD processes, the customer involvement. And that prevented us from being this dot-com that was focused on something different. We were focused on customers and learning from customers and making from them. So that's how we survived. But that was so, the biggest challenge. So I'm going to add in, all we knew is TMSs. Like we, to Mary Beth's point, that was a dozen years of development. So while dot com was, oh, I'm going to be a market maker and all that sort of, we, we were TMS. So the VC comes in, so does it run on the internet? We say, yes, it does. And then we say it's a TMS and their eyes glaze over and they fall asleep, but they give us money. And we went and did what we know best, which is building a TMS, which has been a real strong suit for us. We stuck to our knitting instead of wandering off into a path of market makers and all that yeah. dot-com stuff. Now, would you guys say, was there like a pivotal moment that kind of either changed um, the trajectory of the company early on? Was there something that stood out where you go, wow, that was really impactful? I mean, certainly the acquisition is huge, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it's yeah. right there. Uh, that yeah. was a, a huge moment for sure for everybody. Yeah, the, the, Paul's, yeah, the, the acquisition. And, and one of the <clears throat> interesting things um, with the trajectory of the product is, as Carl's saying, we were TMS first uh, with the new technology, but we kind of knew that we'd always be acquired at some point in time. That the TMS space is not an individual standalone space for the market value that, that we were looking to drive. So the other thing from the, from the acquisition is we architected it right from the beginning, knowing where our boundaries were, where we would fit into the ERP ecosystem and you know, either an Oracle or an SAP type of a shop. So that uh, trajectory to, to get acquired was, was always part of our objective. So, and I think Carl, you alluded to it, right? The customer centricity was one of the, the main things that kind of stood out, part of the vision of the company. So when you guys started, how did that, customer focus and the feedback from the customer, how did that play into feeding into what G3 ultimately became as a product? Well, so we know a lot, we don't know everything. And we would bring customers in, for instance, we certainly knew a lot about 
domestic over the road truckload, but we're not experts in ocean, we're not experts in rail. So when we wanted to build out that functionality, we had, you know, we enticed clients, if you will, <laughs> into, hey, look at this cool new group that's doing a TMS. We would bring them in, in working groups, and it would be a very focused sessions. And we would, if you will, sort of pick their brains. And in those sessions, it wouldn't just be, you know, marketing people and that sort of thing. We'd bring in the developers, the QA people. So it was a very collaborative sort of environment that we set up to understand what does the software need to do for those people. And it was, that, that's, we, we did that from day one. Yeah, we often said that we didn't have a lot of our own good ideas, but what we were really good at is listening to all of your ideas and being able to incorporate them. Well, and that's really important, right? Because I remember my time at, at Gardner, sometimes have these vendors say, hey, Bart, I want to show you a brand new product that we developed. And I go like, why did you develop that? There's no customers <laughs> asking for it, right? So instead of listening to the customer going out to the market and saying what's really important, they developed something. Obviously, people don't like hearing it was no surprise that that customer didn't renew their license with Gartner and two years later they came back and I thought, uh oh, here it's gonna go, they're gonna complain again. They said, you're actually absolutely right. We didn't sell a single license of that product. So it's really very important that you start the product but also continue growing uh, the product by listening to the customers. And I think you said as well, you're engineers, right? You, you didn't come necessarily as operators out of the industry. So how do you do that? How did you organize that before there was the whole formal SIG and everything to, to kind of generate that feedback? And then how did it go, Jim, from the product development perspective to, to kind of say out of everything all these new customers are saying, what do we actually prioritize on to put in the product? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we had, as Carl mentioned, the basis, the TMS knowledge, and we knew what to build to get started, you know, as far as a basis to overcome all the woes of the past and limitations. You know, Carl put on a pot of coffee and, and <laughs> typed up a 200-page requirements document for a rating engine. Um, and we would use that to kind of drive the discussion. So we had the basics to start with, and we'd run them by the customers. One of my favorite stories, and this customer is actually still a customer today, is uh, a paper company based in Finland who was starting a project three in letters. three letters. I, I'm not allowed, I can use her name, but I didn't ask them. Uh, who were starting a project in the year 2000. Well, we started G-Log in 1999 in April. So in 2000, we didn't have any product yet. And this company wanted working product. They were, they were starting a project in 2000 and wanted working product. And we went over, we were in a sales cycle, and, you know, as JP mentioned, Mitch, you know, Mitch wanted to sell. He wanted, hey, let's get, get in on this deal. Yeah, well, we I was the we one in Finland yeah. <laughs> dancing around that. <laughs> Mary Beth went first, I did second. I mean, we were, and it was just, all we have is PowerPoint. So we let that customer go uh, because we weren't ready for them. They tried a competitor for two years. And they came back to us two years later and worked with us very collaboratively. We were in their offices, they were in our offices for several years. And a lot of the functionality you see in the product today is because of that collaboration uh, that we had with them on uh, consoles, I think, and cleans. Oh yeah, the, yeah. ocean, so all a lot, of those. It's, yeah. a, you know, it's a great story and that's how we did it, just you know, running by what the ideas we had, running against them for the real world and putting that back into the product. Awesome. Now let's fast forward a couple of years because now comes the, the Oracle acquisition, which is a pretty big event. Derek, can you talk a little bit about that, kind of how that came about and then how you overcame as a company, as G-Log really, the challenge of kind of integrating yourself in this massive company that Oracle is? Sure, happy to relive that memory. Um, <laughs> So if you wind back the clock to uh, the early 2000s, um, Oracle went on a, uh, embarked on a strategy of expanding our business applications. So Oracle's foundational product was, of course, the Oracle database, and that's what Oracle you know, got, was built upon. Uh, and we had built out some applications, the Oracle eBusiness Suite, which was also quite successful, but we wanted to accelerate. And so we acquired a company called uh, PeopleSoft, which 
PeopleSoft had acquired J.D. Edwards before that. So anyway, we started to accelerate um, through not just internal development, but also through acquisitions. And I had the opportunity to join a brand new team that was called Product Strategy, and part of our decision making was where should we build versus where we should buy. And I was doing transportation product strategy, and I said, why do we want to build the seventh best TMS in the world, which was the path that we were on, when we can have the best? Um, and even though Oracle bought several companies, uh, when you when you look at it, we actually didn't, we acquired fewer than the industry average because we actually have very stringent uh, requirements when it comes to an acquisition. You, you have to be buying a leader, both in terms of the domain expertise, their customers, and most importantly, their technology. So we don't want to buy a company and have to like rewrite all the applications. We don't want to, you know, uh, buy something that's built on a lot of competitors' technology again. So G-Log was literally a perfect fit in terms of checking all the boxes. And contrary to popular belief at that time by your predecessors at Gartner who thought the acquisition would be a disaster, uh, it, it turned out to be incredibly um, successful because we were able to leverage what Oracle brought, which was other products, other technologies, uh, uh, even bigger customer base, and a global reach in terms of partners and products and customers, and it was a, a rocket ship, should I say, once we brought those two things together. Right, and I think even since then, there's been a lot of acquisitions in this space, and the fact is, a lot of them aren't very successful, and a big part of it is because it's not the technology, but a lot of the people behind the technology leave. And obviously, there's proof here that most of the, comp the people that were behind the product stayed and are still here, you know, after 20 years after the acquisition. So I think that obviously has a, has a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, the most important part of any acquisition, even in technology, I say the technology is important, which is, is mm -hmm. important, but it's the people. You know, right. the, the software doesn't write itself. So if you lose the people, um, all you have is a lot of code. And the long-term sustainability of that is, is well, it's, it's limited. So from day one, it's not just G-Log, any of the acquisitions we've done, there's an emphasis on trying to maintain, particularly the engineering teams, the, pe the sales teams, the people who are customer facing, because if you lose those people, you, you lose all the expertise, you lose, you lose everything. Right. Yeah, and I think the, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, yeah, so one of the interesting dynamics too is what happened is, kept uh, the core uh, developers uh, here. Um, many, many of the developers in the room have, have the G-Log part on it too. But being part of Oracle, we did not retain a lot of the consultants. So a lot of them uh, move, moved on. And that ended up being an absolute blessing, I believe, in, in, at the time, because it created this partner ecosystem that we, have, we all have today and that we benefit from. And some of that was just the, as the trajectory uh, changed. We had folks that decided, um, you know, I want to be more creative. I want to go out and build my own my own company, but I'm still going to be part of the the uh, TMS space here with with Oracle. And that was a unique uh, catalyst that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Hey, and Bart, I, I, when we announced the acquisition, I believe we were at our fusion. That's a G good point. Fusion user conference down in, it was Miami or wherever? Miami in a hurricane. Yeah, is what in we a hurricane. We, right. And we announced that we had just been acquired by Oracle. So it was an event like this that Oracle put on, and, you know, oddly enough, called Fusion, which of course is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and just to clear something up, I mean, the official word is Derek left, you know, resigned from G Log and went to Oracle. There is a rumor that we planted him there, we paid him <laughs> to go to Oracle and you know, stay under, under the radar for a couple years before he acquires us. Um, but there's a little bit of truth in that. Well, I'll add on, you know, um, when we were doing the sale process, SAP actually was interested also in G-Log. Um, and what was interesting is, is the people at SAP ultimately decided not to pursue a deal buying G-Log because the chief architects inside said, well, I'll just write what they have, and I'll have it in 18 months for you. So, um, How are they doing, JP? Yeah, so, you know. How's that going, JP? <laughs>
they literally they put 200 R&D people in Waldorf and uh, you know 20 at least had doctors at logistics and they worked on a product for well over three some years it became SAP TM 6.0 which never got implemented wow. it was completely destroyed and thrown away so and it was the complete you know and I was in there and it's like you have to talk collaborative it's just like we were points we're talking before you have to talk to your customers the nuances will kill you in this business you have maybe to GP was the plan I was <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? Yeah, after 10 years, I did ask that same individual, how's that rewrite yeah. going for you? Yeah. So talking about that, right, obviously there was a lot of other companies, including SAP, that were working on their TMS. So if you look at it, and I'll start with you, Paul, from a perspective of innovation, right, how do you foster that culture of continuous innovation and then stay ahead of, like, the, the technology trends and where it was going? Because... We also went from the G-Log acquisition, but then after that, you went on the cloud, you know, and then continued to innovate. And it was something at Garden, we always, why Oracle was positioned where they were, because there was always so much innovation in the product. So how did you approach that early on, but then how do you continue the path of innovation? Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's been an impressive evolution to watch the, the architecture that we had put together as a group really has survived pretty well. Uh, that the, you know, the back end, uh, diagrams that we have of our architecture, they really are still very accurate. It was built to have open APIs, uh, application server that can be running algorithms as well as user interface. So there was a lot that went into that. But the, the biggest thing is the, the transition to cloud, uh, for sure, and the, the Oracle cloud infrastructure. So that's how we're really continuing to stay on top of that tech stack, because things like the autonomous database, the analytics cloud that we're looking at, the machine learning, AI, all of those things come with very little effort because they're just another API that we pull into our service. And it's really helping us to continue with the innovation and then pass that innovation along to all of you, the customers as well as the partners can build on top of that. So it's really neat to see how it's transformed. Right. Derek, you want to add on to that, how you approach it from an, also an innovation, not just pure inside of the TMS, but then also how do you see it on a larger scale combining it maybe with YARD, with WMS, with other systems that are converging to provide a broader solution to the customers? Yeah, I guess I would start just by saying that we've taken that initial um, spirit of customer collaboration, the joint application development or JAD process, and we've formalized that whether it's the user group community here, our customer advisory board, the idea lab, but all of that at the end of the day ties back to the fact that, you know, we fundamentally want to have the best product in the market. How do we achieve that? We work with the best companies who also want to run the best product. You know, the best the best coaches want the best athletes, the best athletes want the best coaches, the best race car drivers want the best cars, the best cars are made by the best engineers, the best engineers make the best cars because they work with the best drivers, right? So this has created a, a community, not only of all the customers out there, but com created a mechanism that, I don't want to say we're unstoppable, but we are unstoppable, right? So we continue to evolve the, as the market evolves, as we continue to engage with all of you out there, the product continues to get better. Uh, and that has expanded, Not th th that same mindset is what we take in other areas as we look to sort of break down some of these artificial boundaries that exist. So Mary Beth mentioned you know, inbound versus outbound or different modes of transportation. Why were those managed separately? not because it's some you know, law of physics that they need to be managed that way. That's just the way people were organized or the way the systems were designed. So we, we continue to look for how can we, based off of input from customers, where are their challenges? How can we address them? And as the technology evolves, how can we use those, how can we put those technologies to use in, in practical ways that have sort of meaningful, uh, meaningful results? Very good. Now, Jim, um, I'm going to ask you a little bit to take your crystal ball out. Where do you see the future of transportation management going in the next five years, especially if you see how quickly the world changing, how quickly supply chains have been changed? We see just the last five or ten years, right, how things have changed. Where do you see some opportunities from a technology perspective going, going forward, and how do you think that will impact the product? Yeah, I guess I would start with the, uh, you know, now that all 
most applications are up on the cloud. I would start with the, I, I see that one of the big changes is that these, the clouds are going to do a lot more talking to each other, a lot more communication. The, the APIs are going to become faster, crisper, and if you just look back to even when we launched on the cloud in 2014 or 2015, we were still loading data into the system to get everything. We were still having you know, much longer configurations. And now, if you look at all of our partners, you know, not just the implementation partners, but the software partners that we have, we're, we're talking to their clouds because they now all have clouds. So you don't have to load all the data anymore. You can just talk directly to that cloud. And I see that part I think it's just at the beginning now. I see that really starting to grow, where we initiate sometimes the communication, you know, the conversations with our partners. Our partners come to us and say, hey, I got this cloud, love to hook it up to yours. That's where I see the real power, because then these implementation times, these uh, getting to use the cloud are going to come down, and people will be starting to implement transportation systems much quicker by tying into all these different data sources. Right. Now, <clears throat> the, the um, reality is there's a lot of real-time data out there as well. I think, JP, you had a session, I think, that talked yeah. a little bit about that, right? So how do you see that playing in, especially with now your new startup kind of focused on that as well? How does that impact the TMS? Yeah, I, I see. It's kind of funny. I see the global in-transit inventory visibility on the slide there from 1999. And I still, it's the, that is the challenge, is how do you maintain control of your visibility while you're in transit? I mean, obviously, you from P44 knows this to, in a lot of detail. But like Jim was saying, I think the ability to collaborate among trading partners and that type of collaboration is where the future goes, and that's going to drastically alter the way our workflows happen within our own software itself. And it's, but it's going to be unique to your company. So the ability of the workflow to support that, let's call it ecosystem-wide workflows, yeah. you know, and to be able to directly communicate, and then to be able to handle exceptions. I mean, that's really that's kind of the nirvana we're talking about. But it is. This stuff is so nuanced, but you got to have systems to be able to do that. So. Right. Yeah, and obviously we, we talked about the product, but we've already mentioned a couple of times, right, the whole customer community, right? So, Mary Beth, how do you really form and, and, and formalize the customer community? Because you didn't have that in the beginning. Now we're all sitting here, right? We have not just one OTM SIG. We have three globally, right? Maybe a fourth one coming. Is that correct? Yeah. So how, yeah, do, you, how do you do that? Yes, it's it's with a with a partnership, and the one you know key area is that the SIG is is not run by by Oracle. So the SIG is actually owned and run by you know the body of the customers and and, and implementers and folks here. And as Oracle, we participate in that, uh, and and with with a big commitment from Oracle and you know number of folks to to, to participate. So it's a momentum that that happens, uh, you know, outside of it with through the SIGs. Uh, the other key area becomes, I think, with the technology and having everybody with cloud, is we are all, and a more, those who are not on-prem, you know, a more current uh, version base. And that is very exciting. Because when we look back on our early G-Log days, we could all get together, we would have these JAD sessions, we would have great ideas, but inevitably there's people in the room that are saying, well, it's going to take me two years to migrate up to that, that version. So I like all that new stuff, but it's going to take me too long to get there. But now we are all very current, so this ability to collaborate about what's exactly on the screen, and you can pull up pretty much any part of the software, and everybody here on this, on this table knows the details and can work together with our customers around the product, and we're all in the same current version. Yeah, very good. And I know as you extend that community, we also saw an extension of the market reach, right, where the product, and I was always, again, part of G-Log, it was a global logistics solution, but we're seeing that market reach now going truly global, the most global of any of the TMS vendors out there. So, Derek, how do you approach that as you're going into newer markets? How do you support that, and also from a product perspective? I think there are really sort of two important components to that. One is the customer side, uh, meaning that we needed to, just like we needed to learn how to really do ocean or how to really do rail, we needed to learn how trend, what the, the, the nuances and the specific requirements of running transportation operations in different parts of the world, different, you know, outside of our home geography. And we learned that by working with customers who were running operations in, 
and Africa and South America and Southeast Asia and all the different uh, countries where you know OTM now operates. So we took that same mentality of okay, yeah, we're we think we're pretty smart, but we're also smart enough to know we don't know everything, and we we want to learn from you how okay how our how our rates structured differently in India, how does the execution process work differently, and we incorporated that into the product. The other important component was the partner community because, you know, as great as our product is, it doesn't implement itself. And so having partners who are either global in their reach or partners who have specific skills in different regions, we expanded that ecosystem of implementation partners. So we have experts now in all those markets as well as the complementary solution partners. So people who help round out the overall logistics offering, whether it's through carrier connectivity or visibility or any of those other solutions. So it's building up that overall network of customer capabilities, like different languages and rating models and global trade support, and building out the partner, partner community. One last thing I would also add on sort of the expansion of the market besides geography, we also expanded in the type, size of customer we used to support. So in the old days, you had to be a very, basically a very big enterprise to justify doing a transportation management system. Uh, we helped drive that sort of level of, let's say, if your freight budget, before if your freight budget wasn't in the hundreds of millions of dollars, it basically wasn't worth, <laughs> worth, worth the effort. And now we have customers that are, you know, in the tens of millions of what they spend on freight per year, and they can easily justify, you know, deploying the software. Right, and I guess a big important part of that is not just the product and the cost of the product, it's how you approach the implementation as well, right? Because for a lot of companies, they don't necessarily always have all the resources available. So how do you approach that to make that implementation easier, to bring people on the cloud easier? No, Carl, that's something you want to talk about. I was going to say, just because they're small doesn't mean they're an easy implementation. Right. And it often it can be more difficult. And to your point, I think a lot of the, you know, the systems integrators have come up with templates and approaches to you know, sort of jumpstart those implementations. So a lot of times they don't have a supporting staff to bring on to do those implementations. And the SIs through you know, years and years, I mean, many of these guys have been doing this for 20 plus years, They've developed approaches that get that implementation moving faster than it would have, you know, previously. Because previously it would have been, well, let's look at the whiteboard and start, you know, drawing what you're doing, and you know, start with step one. These guys have really started to, you know, jumpstart and pre-can, if you will, as much as they can of those implementations. Right. Let's dive into a couple of things on the technical side, right? Because we've seen over the last 30 years these systems completely change, right? Like you said, they were on-premise solutions that were pretty expensive to buy and to implement. I know I was the, the main architect at PepsiCo, and we spent a lot of money on implementing it, uh, and, and the solution was expensive as well. But when it, we now see it going to microservices architecture, it's using API. So Paul, how do you see that evolving from going, I think at the time when G-Log was started, we, we, we heard everything about XML. I think there were some people that were saying EDI is dead, long live XML. We all know EDI is still alive and kicking, still being used in our industry all over the place. Yeah. But now we're at APIs. How do you see that evolving? Yeah, EDI is still ugly, so that, that has not changed. So that, uh, it is fascinating to look at the evolution of it. That, you know, there's always talk, uh, but in this case, you really can look back at, if you look at the EDI and I look at it from the documentation perspective, not just the, the technical implementation, but you just look at how EDI is documented and anyone who's worked with it, it's really pretty cryptic, hard to work with. XML, slightly better. Uh, it's still pretty cryptic. The XML document, kind of easy to read, but the documentation, not at all. JSON and REST, you can just see it. Like, it is a thing that forces you to create better documentation of all the elements that are inside that. So it, it comes from both the, the technical side of it being more efficient, but also just better documentation to go along with it. And that's all transitioning towards the, the ecosystem so that you can get that Oracle Business Network because that's where these systems are gonna be able to talk to each other just seamlessly. And that's really the evolution that started if you look back from EDI being very cryptic, very difficult to work with to 
the evolution up to this JSON and REST APIs, and the next step is the, the business network where it just comes for free. Right. Now, Derek, you, you talked a little bit about it earlier, but how does that new architecture and then things like API really help with the interoperability? Because Oracle probably now has within supply chain pretty much every type of solution that you can imagine. You still see companies using multiple vendors, but how does that impact interoperability and drive people more to a single platform, not necessarily just to one, but more towards a single platform? Well, the simple answer is just get Oracle, and you know, then all that interoperability goes away. Uh, but the reality is that, again, for most organizations, they're going to have technologies from from different vendors. Um, what, and if you attended this event over the years, you will have seen an, exp I would say, a, a significant growth in the number of complementary service partners, basically companies that have other technology or sometimes their service providers like the, uh, you know, digital freight brokers and so on. That growth has been completely enabled by changes in integration technology and movement to the cloud. Right? So it is easier today, than it, easier today than it ever was as far as integrating these systems regardless of who, what company is the, uh, the vendor of them. And uh, you know the time and effort that it takes to deploy them. You know, think about the days when you have to worry about: and do I have the right updated version of PC Miler installed? I mean, who who thinks about managing that stuff anymore? You don't. It's it's a real time call. You always you always get the latest. And at the same time, organizations again, you know, are driving for improvements in their supply chain. And of course, how do you make a process better? Well, the more the more end to end you're looking, the broader view you have of not just transportation, but transportation and warehousing, warehousing and order fulfillment, and my demand plan, and all the other aspects. So in order to have a higher level of performance means you need to manage uh, a broader scope. And to do that at a system level, you need better integration between them, whether it's a all Oracle solution or you know a heterogeneous one. Yeah, very good. Now, yeah, I would just add on to that. It's not just at you know, kind of our level, you know, our logistics level that, that we're starting to see a lot more collaboration between our clouds. Even at a higher level, you look at announcements by Oracle about their uh, deploying their autonomous database in the Microsoft Azure cloud and having connectivity between our two clouds, putting the clouds together. I think you'll see a lot more of that where it makes sense. I mean, not all clouds will come together, but where it makes sense, like in the whole Microsoft Oracle agreement. Uh, that will drive even more uh, tightness and more collaboration between the clouds. Very good. Maybe as a, a follow-up for you, Jim, because one topic we haven't addressed yet that you see at every conference, right? We talk about artificial intelligence. So if you look at that, how that, again, uh, is, is a newer application of driving additional capability in the system now, in the cloud infrastructure, with microservices, um, in a world where we get access to a lot of data with APIs, what do you see currently truly as a, a true role for AI? Not what's possible and what's kind of dreaming, but what you already have in the product today, and where do you see that maybe in the next few years where you can leverage that more to create more value for the customer base? You mean besides figuring out whether to have your conference in Philadelphia or Minneapolis? Yeah, correct. Yeah, because, <laughs> correct. Yeah, because that, that's number one. Did, Chirac, but, did we use AI for that to determine? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do see, um, you know, it, I don't think it's, it's hype like some technologies come along and they're hype and they're forgotten about in a couple of years. I do think AI does hold a lot of potential. I think there's the, the gen AI that holds potential, like we're seeing it inside of our HCM apps being used all over the place. You know, you can now write a uh, a review of someone with a couple of clicks, you know, and just put some high-level stuff and you, you greatly, you know, reduce your management time. Um, but in transportation and logistics, I do think it's going to be more on the back-end side that the value is going to come more <clears throat> to expand our planning, get better planning, get more realistic planning, get something that's maybe based on history and take into account weather and other factors that you could never write like regular software to, to come up to factor in all of those things to come up with a, a better transportation plan. But 
the AI engines that, that we're using and will continue to improve can you know, drive that and drive some of the, the back end stuff even better from a planning perspective, maybe even from a, an integration perspective, you know, in, in you know, cleaning all the integrations up. I see a lot of potential in, in all of that back end area. Yeah, I definitely agree on the collaboration side. That's my best use, I think, for AI in logistics is, especially with the data going on between trading partners, you trade trading partners of all different technical levels, like carriers, for example. The data may be accurate, but technically it's not, and that's where AI could actually identify anomalies. So identifying anomalies with the collaboration across trading partners, I think, is probably going to be the biggest use of AI. Could we use AI to maybe come up with this collaboration between two trading partners? Eh, maybe, but I really think you know identifying anomalies is probably the first choice. Yeah, I'll be excited to see with our agent workflow architecture that we've baked in from, from day one, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of use cases where there'll be a lot of AI-driven um, automation uh, that that'll, we'll be able to orchestrate through uh, the product, collaborating outside as well as orchestrating execution stuff inside of OTM. Yeah, I think the other part is even you know how you interface with the, the UI and the UX, right? Make it easier. And you know, I talked to a lot of people, right? In, in, in transportation, a lot of people are kind of a little bit weary about AI, and they go, I'm kind of scared of AI, right? And they go, Well, do you guys have an iPhone? It's like, yeah, we have an iPhone. It's like you use AI your entire day. You look at that thing, it opens up. That's AI, right? And you don't always have to know what it is to be able to get use out of it. Uh, in my view, it just helps to, to you know, kind of improve and uh, speed up things, right? It's a little bit like it doesn't replace an application. It's like a car. You need an engine. You need fuel, which is the data. But the AI is kind of like that additive you put in the fuel to make it faster, make it more performant. Yeah, I think I, um, I'm, I'll paraphrase. I think it's one of the Gartner analysts. don't remember the gentleman's name at the moment. But um, the comment was basically, humans, we tend to overestimate the impact of change or new technologies in the short term, but we underestimate the impact over the long term. So we, we talked about the dot-com craze, right? So yeah. we overestimated the impact of marketplaces and all that, of course, crashed and burned. But if you look at the long-term impact of the internet, e-commerce, you know, substantial, substantial change. Uh, artificial intelligence technologies, I think, will be the same way. Right now, we're in the peak of uh, <laughs> overhyped expectations, mm -hmm. uh, but long-term-wise, the, the implications will be um, significant. Um, uh, however, I don't think they will be dire. <laughs> it, it's not like we're going to you know, put uh, humanity out of, out of business by any means, because one of the most fundamental problems in supply chain organizations today is not having enough people to do the work. And the only way you can improve that is either you need to create more people, which means we all need to get started right away, and that's a long-term, multi-generational thing, and I don't think it's going to happen, um, or you Im increase productivity. And artificial intelligence is just the next wave of technology that will help drive uh, that additional level of productivity. That's a great statement. I I was, I was going to say, we're, we're doing our part because uh, the folks here are having their kids and the kids are going to college and now they're into the, now, the, into the ecosystem. So you know, we are trying to find those people to you know, continue the logistics uh, operations. Very good. Where, where do they sign up? Is there a <laughs> sign up when you leave the room? You can have your kids apply to Oracle. Yeah. Very good. But with that, I think we have just about 10 minutes left. Uh, so this is a section where you, you have all these folks here. If you have any questions around G-Log, OTM, this is kind of your time to ask those questions. Um, you probably, uh, we talked about a lot of things, but you probably have things that we didn't answer or we didn't get to. So who's got the first question? Jeff. Jim, what was the most pivotal one? And you said it was agents. Who came up with those? So Jay asked who came up with the list of 25? Who came up with agents? Oh, okay. Uh, agents, uh, I would say it's Eric, right? Yeah, Eric Floyderman is our, uh, uh, well, he's, he's a funny anecdote, too. He was, if, if Paul was number seven, Eric was number five. So Eric was, Eric worked with us at back at Manu as a consultant, and um, he's a MIT grad, incredibly smart, just he codes faster than, than 
then you can even type a, do type yeah. a document. He talks and he writes Java faster than anyone can. But anyway, he, he had this vision of, you know, this publish and subscribe, you know, workflow, agents run in the back end, and, and you know, we were all, you know, a little, okay, let's see, let's see a little more. Wait, wait. And like, he, he made it happen. He was, he's really, he's a really sharp guy, and he's, he's still with us today, um, and, and still going strong and supporting all of our software, Paul. Yeah, that, yeah, that's one I'll never forget, is my first day coming into the office, and there's just seven people. You've never heard so much tapping on the keyboard <laughs> No, no voices. Like nobody's talking to. They, oh, I have a story on that. And and the feeling for me was like, wow, this is going to be really successful. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> what? No. Uh, no, Eric does not. We like don't let him out. We had two Eric's. Actually, when we started the company, you, your name had to be either Eric or Paul, because our first five hires were Eric or Paul. So we had Eric Rosenblum as our database guy. Eric Leuterman was our app server guy, and then Paul was our kind of business application guy, and, and we had Paul who was running the, the back end, and another Paul writing, rating, so. So uh, the other funny story was gonna be, but I think there was 10 of us in that cleaned out little office we had up front, and they're all complete software nerds, geeks, it's us engineers sitting there typing literally with their headphones on, refusing to talk to each other, everyone hands down and everything. The highlight of my day was when the FedEx person walked through the door so I could talk to somebody for five seconds. I'm the extrovert of the group and I was struggling. <laughs> Very good. Since we do have a, a couple more minutes and there's no more question, maybe I'll give you just time very quickly, either a final word that comes to mind over the last 25 years or a final remark. I guess maybe final remark is it's, it, this is all inspiring. I would never have thought when we were 25 years ago that, that we would be sitting here today, uh, all still very much together, still collaborating and working together. So mostly my thought is just thank you. Awesome. Too. And I, I'd say the same thing and also add on like the um, you know, even though we commented about this crowd being a drinking crowd, I, I do think of uh, what's great about our customers is that they're all logistics professionals. It's not just a job to you, you want to improve. You want to improve the way you run your business. Everybody that I deal with, it's, they're not just, hey, I gotta get this done because it's my job. They're doing it because this is their career and they wanna improve. So I appreciate all of you for being our customers and making our product great. Yeah, and I'd echo that. And, and I'd also say, 25 years went by really quickly. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable how quickly it went by. It's just, uh, it's, and, and, and I think about it and I say, I've worked at Oracle for 19 years. Like, I've never worked anywhere that long. It's just amazing. But I, I do want to thank all of you, the, the SIs, the complimentary software partners, and of course, all the customers. You guys have been fantastic. So for me, it's, I mean, isn't transportation just fascinating? I mean, I am. I mean, I've been in this industry for 40 years, and it's still every day you learn something new and something fascinating. I know it's not, it's kind of a niche industry in itself, but it's just, it's, it's, we're solving different problems, but in some ways we're still solving the same problems. All in all, it's like these fun slides that we're looking up here. It's the same things that we were solving today. A lot of them are just different. We're solving it differently, but it's still the same type of problems. But how and the nuances are just, you know, it's all inspiring. So, no, I just, I just love transportation. So that's my finals. I, I would just add that I think one of the reasons we've, we've been so successful is the spirit of cooperation that exists within the community. Jim touched upon in terms of, you know, we're all motivated to do the best. Uh, but I, I, I have not seen any other sort of group where people who work for com competing companies in the same industry or partners who compete for you know, the same business and the willingness to sort of share and help the overall community be better. It's, uh, it's pretty unprecedented. So those thanks go out to everyone who participates. Uh, so I can speak to the fits with all the customer collaboration and looking back at the SIGs. And I remember presenting the first few up in Connecticut, which it wasn't really a SIG at the time, but still, I knew nothing about transportation at that point. And yet I was standing up presenting to a lot of people like yourselves that at that time knew a lot about transportation software. 
that was really awkward, but it's evolved to the point where what I think was really neat with these customer forums for people that have been here for the SIG for a number of years, they started those forums downstairs and we as development would have to generate not just the answers but the questions. So we would be forcing the content and now we just sit back and it's customer to customer interaction. So that's really neat to see how that has evolved over the years to the point that that collaboration is happening across all of you, to the point that many of you are the proponents. And it means so much more, I think, to the other customers to hear someone talking about, yeah, we have practically no downtime with this service. It's really positive. Talking about our opt-in features as a positive, where sometimes people look at it like, oh, I have to opt in. There's customers out there that are talking about how this is really helpful to them to let them take on that feature. So it's really helpful to have you guys out there supporting all of what we do. And a small thing for the, the Finnish company, the paper company, so I got to go there. The, their office was in Belgium, and they helped uh, foster my love of Belgian beers. So. <laughs> That's our starter. Yeah. That, that brings it back to me that everything ends a lone Belgian here, but um, we're out of time. I just want to thank the panel for sharing all these insights with us today. So before we call it, yeah. wow.